you're watching Faith and Reason. A discussion about God, politics, and pop culture. From the perspective of our pastors, who are not afraid to tackle and ask the hard questions. A Christian talk show for those on a spiritual journey. This is Faith and Reason. Welcome to Faith and Reason, a program that looks at a number of topics from a Christian point of view. My name is Pastor Rick Spence, Fortley Gospel Church. With me, as always, Pastor George Crespo, First Baptist Church, Cliffside Park. And uh, we want to topic, uh, tackle a topic today called The Lost World of Adam and Eve. And it actually comes from uh, a book, and, and I'll, let me put this up here so you can see it. Actually, I've got to do this right. Okay, put it up here. It says, um, John Walton is the author. He's uh, a professor of Old Testament at Wheaton College in graduate school. Uh, he's also been the Old Testament professor at Moody Bible College, um, a couple of uh, key evangelical schools in America. Um, he's written books called The Lost World of Scripture, The Lost World of Genesis 1, Ancient Near Eastern Thought, and the Old Testament the Essential Bible Companion, the NIV Application Commentary, Genesis, and the NIV Biblical Background Commentary, Old Testament. Um, and so with that, with that background, he's tackled this topic of the lost world of Adam and Eve. And, and he's, uh, well, really, uh, l- let, me, let me just say that, uh, well, Pastor George here has read the book. I have not read the book, but I'm asking the questions today. Uh, I've, I've seen some of his teaching, and, and I saw an hour summary of the book, really. Which is on, very good. On YouTube. And it's, yeah. uh, Actually, yeah, that's, if you go to YouTube and look up his name, if you don't want to read the book, those, that, that one-hour video is tremendous to really summarize everything. Yes, it captures a lot, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, question. Walton, in his book, argues that the Genesis account is not about material origins. What does he mean, and what is the Genesis account about? Yeah. Why don't we jump into this? Well, one of the things that he does uh, incorrectly is because he is an Old Testament scholar, and um, sometimes I find that people who are very much that's their forte. As an Old Testament scholar, is great, but one of the things he met, does mess up even in the video is that he mentions uh, the material uh, interpretation of Genesis being more like a Western modern type understanding, which it is. Mm-hmm. When people look at Genesis, they always talk about on the first day God created, and they think mm-hmm. always in material terms. Right. Uh, he created things right. and people, and and um, and that's not a Hebrew way of looking at. It. But but the thing, the thought does go back. Uh, I have found it as early as uh, Aquinas, mm-hmm. so it's not a modern thing. But it is something something I think that is infected by uh, the Greek uh, thought world. Uh, mm-hmm. The Greek element really, in many ways, has completely infected uh, the study of the Bible. And slowly, I've seen scholars weaning off this nonsense, but it became so ingrained with Christianity uh, very early on in in the faith. I mean, we're talking Justin Martyr was a Platonist, and Platonism first got uh, integrated with Christianity, then it was uh, Aristotelianism got integrated with, so it, it takes a lot of untangling. But when you look at, at, at uh, Genesis, he says it's not about material uh, creation, the focus. The real focus is that God is creating order mm-hmm. out of chaos. Right. And he's creating then that order to be functional. And he'll go through the six days of Genesis to show how first in the first three days it's order being created. There's chaos. And he points out uh, like, you know, how uh, in the NIV he says empty and void. The earth mm-hmm. is empty and void. That those two Hebrew terms, tohu and bohu, mm-hmm. talk about a, a primordial chaos mm-hmm. uh, that seeks to bring all other things into disorder. Right. And so they must be controlled and brought back into an orderly fashion. And then he then mentions the once you have the, the idea of order, then you have functionality. That's why you have light first and then the sun, mm-hmm. which brings about the functionality of that order. Right. So, again, but it's not about material creation. It's not about God uh, creating things, but okay. rather creating order, bringing, bringing an, uh, a certain atmosphere, which we're going to talk more about, that, right. that sacred space yeah. where God right. can okay. abide. Listen, I, I, I'm just afraid that, um, you know, I, I, so far I'm tracking with what you're saying, but I, I suspect there's a few people watching saying, 
What is he talking about? Let, let's start with the real simple basics. Um, so he would not advocate for a seven or, or, or a one week creation of the world. There's nothing, and then all of a sudden God creates the world in, in, in six days and rests on the no, seventh. No, that's the whole thing. See, he would have no problem with the six days. Okay. The seventh, we'll, we can get to, uh, well, we, you know, we'll talk as you brought up. The six days, he would see it as six days. Because again, he says Moses is not a scientist. Right. He's now writing a scientific manual. One of the errors that I have found in, much, in, in, in a great deal of my reading when it comes to the conservative side is that they all try to tackle Moses like the first scientist. Right, right. Like somehow when, when God reveals things to Moses, he reveals it in language that he comprehends. Mm -hmm. That's like if God came to me and started speaking to me in Hebraic cultural or even maybe things that would be more mm -hmm. common to a Canadian, I'd be like, say what? <laughs> <laughs> But he has to come within my culture and say, well, here's a Hispanic man who's been raised in America. How does he think? What images will work with him? What concepts can I use? Mm -hmm. When he goes to Moses, we're talking two, two, uh, two millenniums before Jesus. Christ, yeah. um, come on. This man does not think like a 21st century American. And it's not like God is revealing something to Moses that, oh, this makes no sense to you, Moses, but it will make sense one day to the sun, when all these so, creationists yeah. take hold of it and show that it's all material. Mm -hmm. That's not what it is. So the six days can be taken literally because it's not talking about material creation. Mm -hmm. It's talking about functionality, about order. Just like you mentioned, the seventh day, again, we're going to we're, we're skip, so there's no sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the seventh day, the idea of resting says it's not God taking a nap. Right. This is not, oh, oh, I'm all done, I'm finished, you know, I'm exhausted. The whole idea of rest is the idea of God coming to abide with his creation. What God is creating, according to John Walton, and, and I think he's right, uh, is that God is creating a, a sacred space, a temple area, where he's going to abide there, where mm -hmm. he's going to rule there. And, um, and that element has to be seen. And the point, the point is that people don't see it because they keep reading Genesis mm -hmm. like it's a scientific manual. Right, right. I remember when I was in, being interviewed in a church uh, before I became pastor of this church, and this was one of the big sticklers. Do you believe in the six literal days of creation? And the lady's just pushing me. And I'm thinking, man, I've read more on Genesis than she will ever do if she lived two lifetimes. Mm -hmm. And I was just so offended. I finally just looked at her and said, well, I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. I thought it was so stupid. You're making such a, a big deal about this. Mm -hmm. But Moses is not writing a scientific text. <clears throat> this is not meant to teach us uh, science. The, the Bible is not meant to teach us science or math or history. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's teaching us how to be saved, how to come into communion with God. Right, right, right. And Moses, again, is telling a story which, when you see it, it will make perfect sense. And it will make perfect sense, especially when you come to the tabernacle, mm -hmm. when you come to the temple. It goes to show that Adam destroyed what should have been, Adam and Eve destroyed the place that should have been a sacred space for God. And now God, when he brings the tabernacles, it's God redoing it. Mm -hmm. He's now once again trying to recreate that space and create, recreate that order, so again, it will then travel to the rest of the world where there's a lot of chaos. Okay, okay. L listen, um, you know, I, I watched, uh, I, I spent some time looking at uh, Dr. John Walton today and on YouTube, and uh, it's interesting. Basically, I think one of the strengths of his argument, and, and then I'll come back to you with a question, uh, is that he's trying to say that, that he is firmly committed to the idea that the Bible is the inspired Word of God, that it yes. is authoritative, that it's the Word of God, God speaking, communicating truth to Moses first in Genesis and to, to us today. Um, and one of the problems is that we have created a, a, almost a false dichotomy between science and religion, which shouldn't be there. Now, uh, on the other hand, and matter of fact, even the Pope has got into it, you know, basically embracing evolution in some ways or the simplistic mm -hmm. version of his, his response. But, um, but wh where science is atheistic, yes, we have a problem with science. You yes. know, it starts with a no God, God can't be involved in this. Uh, where science is looking at the evidence and coming to conclusions, we can be in agreement with that if we accept the fact that the first three chapters of Genesis is not a scientific account of how yeah. God created the world in, in a certain time frame, which was roughly 6,000 years ago. Uh, if we can free ourselves up from that and see it for what it is actually saying, and for someone who is uh, reading in Hebrew and studying and, and, and really a world expert in, in what is being said, 
committed to the authority of Scripture, then coming to different conclusions, which can diffuse some of the argument between uh, yeah. science. See, again, we, we look at the Bible as the inspired Word of God. Right. But and, then and we treat it in, that, in a course. very cheapened way. Yes. Nobody who, for example, who goes to study, you know, things, other things that I study. For example, when, when I look at Shakespeare, and I love to read Shakespeare, I study the culture in which he lived in. I study the language that he used. Uh, I study, you know, the imagery. Why would he use this imagery and what did it entail, you know? Uh, oh, when he's using this, this kind of imagery, it goes back to this medieval thought. All these little details. But it seems that when people study the Bible, it's just like it's a 21st century book, and we're reading it like, oh, yeah, it's written for me at this moment right now. Mm -hmm. And they don't realize, first of all, it's, a, it's the inspired word of God that was written within a certain context. Mm -hmm. So if you don't try to seek what it meant in the original language, what it meant in the original context, you're obviously then just saying, well, whatever it feels like to me, whatever, you know, uh, John MacArthur tells me whatever, I'll just take that immediately. Oh, my pastor tells me, I'll take that immediately and, and forget about mm -hmm. actually studying and going to the context. But when you look at the context, you realize, wait a minute, uh, this is not what Moses is talking about. This is not what a, what a man in that time would have talked about. Even the fact that he mentions the fact that uh, when Moses talks about uh, Adam and Eve, mm -hmm. he says those cannot be their names. Right. Because there was no Hebrew language in the time of Adam and Eve. And these right. are Hebrew names. Um, yeah. These are names given to them to talk about the representation of who they are mm -hmm. and the role that they play mm -hmm. uh, within the story. Yeah. Uh, but again, people lose that context. Once you lose the idea of context, anything goes. You can basically read the Bible any way you want to. And case in point is, people are reading it like it's a scientific manual. Like, mm -hmm. oh, on the first day, you know, 24 hours or whatever, this is what occurred. Mm -hmm. Even the idea when you said about 6,000, again, this is not the point that, that Moses is trying to say. Moses is not trying to say, oh, I'm going to pin it down to when it occurred. Even for, for Walton, he'll say that Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are not the same thing. That Genesis 2 is a, a, a sequel mm -hmm. to Genesis 1, right. which we'll, we'll get more into as we, we go to the other questions yeah, about yeah, Adam yeah. and Eve. Yeah. Um, again, it's interesting stuff. It's a, it's a little bit of a... A paradigm shift in, in how we read it, and, and I, I know even from, you know, I, I had to study Hebrew in seminary. I forgot 90% of it, but I had to study the language, <laughs> and, uh, and, and my Hebrew professor, you know, instilled in us that, you know, Genesis 1 is all about uh, filling and forming, you know. The world was empty and void, so the first three days are, are you know, the, the um, you know, the sky and the and the water and the land, that kind of breakdown. Mm -hmm. So you've got the, the forming and then the filling. And, and so uh, I think we get into a lot of trouble. And, and, and let me just say this before we go to break. I, I, I think that there is uh, there's an unfortunate question put to some people saying, are you going to be a Christian or are you going to be a scientist? And, mm -hmm. and, and embrace what science teaches mm -hmm. uh, about uh, their study of where we came from. Um, and, and certainly there's elements of scientists, you know, thinking that we, we disagree with. Uh, but on the same time, uh, this is a good book, and we'll come back to in just a moment, about looking at, at how, um, if we really understand what it's saying, then we can say, okay, where, where is the conflict now with science, as opposed to making it? You've got to have, uh, you know, this creation of the world less than 10,000 years ago, and it's got to be yeah. A, B, and C. Let's go to break, and uh, we'll come back to this topic in a moment. Portly Gospel Church taken a few years back, and uh, uh, Pastor George, why don't you tell us a little bit about First Baptist Church, and uh, we're two pastors working together. We're happy for you to visit either one, but tell us about your church. Uh, we're located at 777 Anderson Avenue in Clifton Park. Uh, our service is at 11 a.m. Uh, we do have a Bible study on Wednesday night, 7.30 p.m., and uh, all our stuff is found on firstbaptistcp.org. We're also on YouTube and uh, Facebook. You can connect with us through there as well. And uh, again, making accessible our Bible studies, our uh, sermons, and now hopefully soon being able to post more uh, Faith and Reason, although we have a few of them there. Yeah, good. You're, you're really getting technical I'm getting techy, man. I'm get, <laughs> by, by the time I'm dead, I should be, I should be very good at this. <laughs> the, the, no, I don't want to say they'll videotape your funeral and post it yeah, somewhere, like, right? <laughs> Last sermon. Uh, no. 
Uh, anyways, uh, bad joke. Uh, let's come back to the topic. We're, we're looking at uh, this book, which is called The Lost World of Adam and Eve. It's, uh, it, it's by Dr. John Walton, who's an evangelical scholar, Old Testament scholar. Um, he has been studying uh, Genesis, and, and he's written a couple books related to the first three chapters of Genesis. Yeah. Chapter one is the, the seven days of creation. Uh, and we've touched on that a little bit. Chapter 2 and 3 have to do with the creation of Adam and Eve, and then chapter 3 is the fall of mm -hmm. Adam, the sin coming into the world. Um, what implications does his reading of Genesis 1 to 3 have for our modern scientific understanding of the origins, where mm -hmm. we came from? Well, one of the conflicts that I continually <coughs> saw as I was reading so many uh, authors, uh, both from the more conservative side and then those who are more open to evolution, was that it seemed to be like a real dichotomy. Either you believe in creation, which meant not evolution, or you believe in evolution. But then you have individuals who are devout believers who believe that God created through the means of evolution. Um, and I can never really reconcile that in any way because on this side you have people using Moses like a scientist. On this side, you have people just dismissing Genesis as mythological. Mm -hmm. and, but then also only these Old Testament scholars like Bruce uh, Walke, which actually was the first guy who I read, was like, wow, wait a minute, he's really questioning this stuff, not as a scientist or a guy studying mythology, but as, as an Old Testament scholar who does believe in the infallible Word of God. Mm -hmm. And, of course, John Walton as well. And their critique is important because it shows that you can believe in, in evolution. You can believe this is the means by which God brought this about, and you can still hold to Genesis. Okay. Because okay. Genesis is not talking about the material creation or how, whether God did it through this means or that means. It's a question more of what God is doing, mm -hmm. order and functionality. Mm -hmm. And you can also believe in creationism, and he doesn't have a problem with that either. No, of course not. <clears throat> but he would have a problem with if you try to read uh, Genesis As a scientific in a literal... Theory. Yeah. You know, it, like if we were there, we would actually see these things in detail occurring in a materialistic type way rather than what God is doing in a general way. Mm -hmm. And obviously he sees Genesis 2 and 3 as, uh, Genesis 1 and 2 as being not, you know, because normally Genesis 2 is read as um, like, oh, Genesis 1 tells you seven days and then, and then Genesis and 2 focuses in on the sixth day. The sixth day yeah. And he shows that, that cannot be because of all things that occur on that, that day. He, he believes, and I, I agree with him, that uh, Genesis 2, because I've seen the, we all know that there's a, uh, some sort of friction between 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. And he sees more 2 as a, as a sequel. Mm -hmm. Genesis 1 sets up the stage, and then ch uh, chapter 2 uh, sets up um, who Adam and Eve are. But in light of other questions that will come up, I'm going to jump right into it. Mm -hmm. He'll show that when God created man in his image, uh, male and female who created them, that it wasn't just Adam and Eve. He'll say, that there were more than Adam and Eve on the earth. Mm -hmm. And, and his, of course, it, we've always been curious. I mean, um, Cain kills his brother, and he goes build a city. Why would you build a city for yourself? One mm -hmm. guy building a whole city for himself. Wow, right, right, right. egocentric. Um, he takes he, a wife. Where's that, where does that wife him. come from? Yeah. Uh, he's afraid that he's going to be hunted down and killed. By who, mom and dad? Mm -hmm. I mean, so he shows that there, there were other humans beside Adam and Eve. Even if Adam and Eve were the first, there were other uh, homo sapiens, other human beings there. Mm -hmm. And out of all these, God chose these two mm -hmm. to serve as, as priests within his temple, to stand as representatives. And they failed in what they were supposed to do. Okay. Just, uh, that, that's a good point, and, and I'm not sure if this is exactly where you wanted to go, but, um, but in one sense, I, we don't think about it in that concept, is that uh, Adam and Eve, almost like a priestly duty, that they are are set up in the Garden of Eden mm -hmm. to be almost like a priest. A priest represents other people, and, uh, and God is in the Garden, and uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is in the Garden, the tree of life is in the Garden, mm -hmm. and so they're working the Garden. They're not just gardeners, they're, they're priests. That's mm -hmm. his concept, yes. which I, I found unique. I, I, I hadn't heard that in other places. Maybe I haven't read br broadly enough. I don't get that in... Well, it's difficult. Uh, I guess it's, not really, it's not really our fault. Preachers don't have the fault because if you read very basic uh, commentaries on Genesis, they don't even entertain that. the fact that the same language used of, of Adam is used of priestly people mm. because they just already, already assume this is what it means. It's an origin story. This is what it means. Yeah, and yeah. therefore, they just dismiss the other one without second thought. These guys don't. 
Okay. And they begin to question things that have not been, been questioned for a long time. Yeah. Uh, l let, me, let me throw one at you. Hopefully it's not a curveball. But uh, okay. uh, Paul, and I know you love Paul, and you spend a and lot baseball, of time. So and baseball, so curveball. And baseball, yeah, we've got both covered. <laughs> so in, in, in Paul, he talks, about, he talks about Adam and Eve significantly. He, yes. he addresses them, and, and he talks about sin entering the world through them. Yes. A, and, and this has always been a, a question for me, to say, okay, um, there is no death until there's sin, is, mm -hmm. is the idea. Now... Now, I heard enough from Walton to say that he would disagree with that idea yeah. that, that nobody died until Adam and Eve sinned. Right. And if you've got multiple people, maybe hundreds of people on the earth, there's death yes. there for that to exist. Mm -hmm. um, give, you, give Walton's argument for that. Not only Walton, but Bruce Walkie in his uh, two-volume commentary on Genesis argues this as well. Uh, we always presume that Adam and Eve were immortal. Mm -hmm. uh, he says, no, they were mortal. This is why they have the tree of life. The tree of life is rejuvenating them, is rejuvenating mm -hmm. all of all the human beings that are there. They're not dying because they're be, being able to partake of this tree. Um, and, they're being, and they're being tested to see if they will be faithful to God mm -hmm. in the function that he has given to them. Mm -hmm. uh, they fail in that. And notice that when they fail in that, uh, then they will die. Mm -hmm. And that's why when Paul says that, uh, uh, through, uh, that death entered through, because of sin. He says, once you sin and you violated God's, God's uh, command, now you've been ostracized from the presence of God. You've been ostracized from the tree of life. Mm -hmm. You cannot rejuvenate. Right. Now you will die. Yes. But he shows that, uh, that, yes, death was already there as a possibility. And this idea of the tree of life rejuvenating is not new to Walkie and uh, Walton. You even find it Augustine talking about that okay. when he talks about his stuff in Genesis. So they understood this idea that they were not uh, immortal. Somewhere the idea came in that, and I think it's more like when you talk about, uh, when you talk about 17th century, 18th century, they tried to talk about the perfect creation. Mm -hmm. Everything was wholesome. And then sin came in and destroyed everything. And it goes to know that even in the midst of all this stuff, there is this disorder. Mm -hmm. There's this, this kind of chaos that's trying to regain the world again. Mm -hmm. And these two had to stand there as priest and priestess and, and fight against this mm -hmm. and prevail over it. And then, of course, what will happen is what God will do at the end in, in Revelation is that he will come and renew all things. Mm -hmm. But they failed. Okay. And so they cast out. So again, a very different picture mm -hmm. okay. of what we have been taught. So I get, people will have very, what I call cognitive, dis, cognitive dissonance, you know, they, when, two, when a new thought comes in and it's so radically different from what you've been taught in Sunday school or wherever, mm -hmm. it's very difficult putting them together. But I really challenge people to, to go and look at this mm -hmm. and try with fresh eyes once again to go back to the text and say, does it really say? Mm -hmm. you right, know? Right. Well, let me give you one more example of does it really say, which is not a question on your list, uh, is in the case of uh, we most of us have been told you've got an empty world, and, uh, and God creates all the animals. He creates Adam. And Adam is the only human. There's nobody um, like him. So God puts him to sleep and he takes a rib from Adam. Yeah. I was in a Bible study where there was a medical doctor in the Bible study. So someone asked, do women have more ribs than men do? You know, I mean, they just... Uh, yeah just as a question, because of the rib story, you yeah. know. And, and so, so now we've been taught in Sunday school and, uh, that, that there's one Adam and then he goes to sleep and God takes a rib out of him. Mm -hmm. Now you've got two people yeah. and they'll become one flesh. How would, uh, how would you respond to that, first of all, from Walkie or even your own yeah. uh, way of rethinking that? Well, that, that to me came in a long time ago because uh, being in Bible college, I had, uh, when I was taking Hebrew, I had to translate the first three chapters of Genesis. And that's when I began to have problems with some of the things that I was being taught on the other places because I couldn't see the things that they were saying. And the rib is not a rib. Uh, the actual word in Hebrew means the side, like a, like a panel almost. Uh, so it's almost like um, the completion of something. Mm -hmm. Here's something and here's what completes it. Here's the identical of the, the other. Right. And so it's not that. That's why he says, here's bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Uh, obviously, she was not flesh of his flesh. She was only supposed to be a rib, not bone. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I mean, it goes to show that it's not what he's, what he's talking about. Here is one who is equal to me, mm -hmm. one who is like me. Again, one who's created in the same image of God that he is. 
And that's what the story is trying to tell us, that here the two will serve together uh, who are been made in the image of God. But it's not that, you know, again, God puts him, takes him a nap and takes out a rib and, you know, mm-hmm. but it's a story. Uh, and he says, again, Adam is not necessarily asleep. It could be very visionary, which again, the language is used. Mm-hmm. It's used of prophets who are having a vision. They're seeing what's going on. Mm-hmm. And he's seeing that this one who's coming is one just like him. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the, the perfect representation on the other side. Mm-hmm. But again, both equal. A very, mm-hmm. very different way of reading it. Because again, we, you, we, we have these pictures in our mind mm-hmm. of things that we've been taught. And it's so hard to get out of them because people, it's almost like saying, if you tell people, well, the, well, the fruit wasn't an apple. They've gotten so used yeah, to an yeah, apple yeah, yeah, that you have yeah. to reteach them again that this yeah. is not what it says in the text. And again, I challenge people to go back into the, into the actual right, story right, right, right. and read as many commentaries as possible on those passages. You see that it's, the, again, Bruce Walkie wrote a commentary, two-volume commentary on that. More difficult, he deals more with the Hebrew. Uh, John Walton's book, book is uh, commentaries on the NIV application commentary. Mm-hmm. And that's a more down-to-earth uh, explanation. Yeah. But again, if you read these books, and they're not difficult to read, they're not, you know, this, this is based upon the scholarly work he's already done. Mm-hmm. So they're more down to earth and understandable. Yeah. And uh, now uh, watch the video. Right, right. No, and, and, and I recommend that as well. Just for, we've got less than two minutes left, so let, let me just say this. Um, one thing you have to appreciate is that John Walkey and and others are coming at this from a place of faith, a place of believing the Bible is authoritative. Mm-hmm. And so they're not coming as a, like you say, I think you said it well a few minutes ago, is that uh, too often either you believe in biblical creation and you are an enemy of evolution or else you throw out the first 15 chapters of Genesis as myth yeah. and therefore you can uh, accept what scientists are proposing, which is a form of atheistic evolution mm-hmm. too often. Um, but what they're doing is saying, okay, what is the first few chapters of Genesis really saying? What is the Bible saying? In other references, obviously, God is creator, and, uh, and he's fully on board with that. God is the creator. God is the designer of the world. Um, and yet, in some ways, as we rethink this, it should bring us to a place of a greater appreciation for the inspiration of the Bible and, mm-hmm. and the work of it. Uh, you've got a minute left. How would you like to share a last thought on this topic. Well, the way I do always, read. Yeah, yes. Read John Walton's book. Also, made, Francis Collins uh, wrote the, the Language of God. And he, again, he believes in evolution. He believes in creation. Um, Biologos.com is where his website and John, uh, John Walton, because of his use, has been asked to consult with that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, expand your mind to see that there is more than one angle. And um, don't, you know, when we close ourselves off, we make the same mistake that uh, the medieval people made in thinking, oh no, the, the Bible teaches that the earth is center of the universe, mm. uh, only to be refuted and said, no, the Bible doesn't teach that. Right. Let's see what the Bible really teaches. What does it really say? Thanks for watching. This has been Faith and Reason. Uh, I trust that you will, uh, if it's the Easter season, you see this, go to church and, uh, and we'll see you next time. God bless. Thank you for watching Faith and Reason. Please join us again next week. We invite you to visit our pastors at one of their churches, Pastor Rick Spence at Fort Lee Gospel Church, or Pastor George Crespo at the First Baptist Church in Cliffside Park. Check out our websites for more information.